Thank you very much. Um, thank, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. the invitation. Um, I uh, first want to uh, uh, somehow apologize for the space that I'm talking right now from, because I'm in, um, uh, in Mexico at the moment, in the city of Tijuana, and it was very difficult to find a place with a Wi-Fi. Um, I'm uh, in the street right now, so I'm in a kind of a public space, so I apologize in front if, if there's some noise happening around me. Um, but um, I prepared a, a, a short presentation uh, for you tonight or in this afternoon, in your afternoon here. It's, uh, here it's a bit early. And um, the presentation is about, um, I, I think, a, a recent project that I have embarked together with other 23 people from around the world um, that is called Urban Front. And that recent project um, is uh, linked to a lot of theoretical findings and um, understandings about what urban practice should be in the coming future. Um, and so the 23 people, um, uh, we have gotten together in many, several occasions to develop a few projects. This is an organization that we began in 2019. Um, and, and our objective was um, to do something that we, um, we used to, the, kind of like the opposite of how cohabitation strategies, which is what Midori just presented, um, we're doing. And I want to talk a little bit about that. And then, of course, um, by the end of the presentation, what I'm going to try to discuss is a little bit the, the role of, obviously, homelessness in this whole scheme uh, that, uh, that I will be uh, talking about. So I'm going to share right now the screen for you. And then um, hopefully things will get a bit uh, more clear as I advance on this. So what you see here in front is um, uh, the an installation that we recently did for the Venice Biennial um, uh, at the International Exhibition of Venice Biennial that just ended. Um, it ended in November of 2021. And this installation was um, thought as some form of initiation into what I'm gonna be talking about, which is what we think is the urban practice of the future or one of the ways to practice urbanization in the future. Um, the, the phase, so this is the entry point. This was on the, it was still on the construction. So I took it when I was there building it, but it was the first time that we put these ticker clock that you see there, uh, which is uh, trying to mimic or trying to work around the, the Wall Street uh, type of aesthetic um, in which rather than putting obviously the stocks or uh, the market, um, we're putting things that certain uh, consequences of that capitalism have produced uh, in urbanization in recent times or that continue to produce and how they are constantly traded um, uh, through uh, obviously the market. No? So you have words like patrick and alienation and this is, was the entry point into this installation. The installation is a, a bit of a labyrinth that you walk in through and then you, you face different situations. But I always like to open up um, in recent times that I've been giving talks with this uh, specific slide um, because it discusses for what is what should we should be much more aware of in these times, which is the idea of what is capitalism, um, uh, what is capitalism today, vis-a-vis -vis the many forms of contemporary resistance that we encounter, right? Um, uh, Midori has just been working. Uh, I participate at the moment in this show um, at Kings Kingsborough College, which is on homelessness. And one of the things that capitalism has generated is the issue of homelessness. Um, and uh, but there's so many fronts in which um, activists have been fighting that it is very difficult to conceive a unitary idea of what are we truly fighting above everything else, right? Whether we uh, work on the environmental sectors, where we work on um, environmental fronts, or activist fronts, or whether we work on gender issues or race issues, or homelessness or housing, um, or all the other fronts that we can think of, I think prim primarily beyond any of those, um, we, they're always encapsulated into a uh, conception of what capitalism has produced in general, right? So, um, from this point on, um, I'm going to be talking about these 11 points on unitary urbanism. So one of the first things that we've asked ourselves is that how can we address not only one side of urbanization, which in this would be you know, housing affordability or homelessness or any of the other fronts, but how to address these in a unitary form, which has been uh, for me 
uh, through a mentor, which is also part of Eventfront, um, uh, a geographer, Marx's geographer, which I have worked uh, a, a lot of time with, but also has been a mentor of mine, uh, David Harvey, in his interpretations of, um, of what of capitalism as such, and in his theoretical conceptions on how we have to see what we face as a unitary lens, with a unitary lens, as a unitary thing. And so from this point on, um, I bring me back into um, Tijuana, although the picture that I'm showing right now is not Tijuana. Uh, the picture that I'm showing you right now is actually in Venice, but in 2008, um, and uh, so that's uh, a little bit more than 11 years ago, 12 years, 13, 14, oh my God, it's a long time ago. Um, but this was an installation of a friend, um, uh, his name is Teddy Cruz, um, that was put in front of the American Pavilion at the Venice Biennial. Um, what he did, he's an architect working here in San Diego, um, uh, Tijuana border region. Um, he's from Guatemala actually. Um, and he decided to cover the whole American pavilion with the border wall. Um, and uh, this was happening in 2008. Um, and I was sitting with Teddy, uh, which by the way, today he turned 60. Um, I'm gonna see him later. Um, I was sitting in front of, his of this installation, of his installation. And then suddenly I received a text uh, that day, which uh, text basically said, Miguel, you have to look at the news. And I go and look at the news. And it was the collapse of the Lehman Brothers. So um, it was a very interesting time because uh, we were just talking about how stupidly and how impossible it was for the whole architecture establishment um, to address the questions of, at that time, we're talking 2008, of neoliberalism as this hyper force of gentrification, privatization, and everything that comes with it. And, um, and then suddenly we received this, this, this text you know, that says the Lehman Brothers collapsed. Um, this, I think, um, was for me, uh, without doubt, the most uh, sort of um, the, the moment that uh, almost my practice in many ways was uh, started to shift. By then, I was um, somehow very involved in Marxist theories and urbanization. I used to be an, a practicing architect when I was living in Mexico, and I was trying to transform my practice into a line that, um, that was more against sort of like the private developer, right? Um, but it was not clear how I was going to address this, right? Um, at that time, I was living in the Netherlands. I was living in Rotterdam. And uh, a lot of the European house, the, the Dutch housing stock, the, the one that used to be social uh, housing, was being privatized. And we were seeing um, a very strong um, uh, sort of force that was displacing uh, people uh, in order to substitute them with some private uh, form of housing. And we wanted to address this, but we were not very sure how to address this, right? At the same time, when I was around that time, you, you were seeing due to different crises, um, and especially the, the Wall Street crisis, the financial crisis of 2008, how it started to generate uh, a bunch of protests around the world in the questions of um, you know, foreclosures um, and how um, the amount of people were being displaced. You can see here sort of also the homelessness that it has produced. This was some, some images of the Spanish uh, sort of rebelliousness uh, against the foreclosures, but it was pretty much the same, the chain that the financial crisis engendered, right? And so, uh, these were together with being in that moment at that Venice Biennial without anyone in the presentation really truly addressing the questions of how capitalism was bringing all these crises, um, uh, really uh, uh, put me face to face to this is uh, what I'm showing right now are images of like while this was happening the crisis, the, the art and architecture world at the Biennial was showing these kind of like impossible things to be done affordably. Um, mostly like uh, banalities and uh, spectacles and all kinds of um, uh, luxurious elements, you know, that were being displayed there as if it was um, pretty much all of these uh, uh, spec uh, cultural spectacle were catering uh, precisely the capitalist world, the millionaires, billionaires. And now, obviously, what we're talking more is like oligarchy, right, that has uh, been created. So. 
it was it was a year um, or a series of moments where I was facing at the at the, at the biennial, um, in which all of these things were uh, put in front of me, trying to conceive or trying to uh, react of how the hell to address all of this. You know? And so, um, the first thing that came uh, to to me to to realize it was the futility. As again, I come from an architecture discipline. It was the, the futility of the architecture discipline at large. Um, there was a time, though, that, uh, that architecture somehow responded to um, a more social forms, right? In this case, I'm showing you images of um, the social or the welfare state type of architecture in which the architect was responding very much to a, a pseudo or like a kind of democratic government in which uh, the architect was um, asked just to produce uh, housing for you know, the general masses. Um, uh, affordability uh, was at the, at the front of uh, a lot of uh, Western welfare states, uh, but also Latin American states. I'm coming from Mexico. Most of this time, the architect was producing social housing all the time. But one big realization for me is that the, the discipline uh, at today's context obviously was not anymore being hired by um, the governments or the welfare state to produce social products, but the new client obviously from the 1980s, 1990s and all the way until today started to become the private enterprise. And therefore it was a realization that in the current uh, climate, so in the neoliberal capitalist climate, um, the, any form of disciplinary apparatus, in this case, architecture, no matter how much it tried, it was always going to be um, uh, basically responding to uh, the client. At that time, it was the welfare state, and now it was the neoliberal state, which was you know, with large corporations. So after that realization, you begin to understand um, this kind of architecture that uh, started to be produced in the 1990s and, and so on, um, which is this... Um, crazy buildings, you know, that, uh, that cost billions, uh, all of them, the majority of them privately owned uh, with cultural uh, programming, with private museums and private enterprises. In a recent podcast I, I had, uh, well, I made uh, last week, I started to call these places the spaces of oligarchy, uh, just simply to go into what is happening today. But before I used to call them neoliberal enclaves, you know, uh, which are all of these types of architectures that contrary to what I, the images that I showed before, which were of social housing, of social enterprises, social uh, libraries, and uh, the welfare that the state was producing at some point, the state produces none of that anymore. And the only thing that we see that cities are being made from is these kinds of things. This is, for example, in New York City, the multi-million dollar uh, developments and only few people that have access to them while of course the majority of the population is struggling uh, to survive. You know? And so this, uh, I'm telling you all of these to frame how cohabitation strategies, which is the practice that Midori presented, um, came to be. Okay. So in 2008, um, when all of this was going on and we were theorizing about all of this, we decided to start a um, nonprofit, but I want you to see the non or to Think of the nonprofit not as an American nonprofit, but this was started in the Netherlands. And in the Netherlands, the concept of a nonprofit as it exists in the US does not exist. We actually started a foundation, but the foundations in the Netherlands have no money, or at least we don't have any money. But we wanted to start an organization that could work as a cooperative um, without any uh, um, uh, form of profit. Uh, in which different people from these different disciplinary uh, lines could um, be part of. So uh, the first strategy that we uh, focused on was to begin to invite different disciplinary uh, uh, people, organizations, from geographers to a lot of artists, um, a lot of um, uh, geographers, social scientists, uh, economists, um, in order to constitute an organization that would, rather than working for the corporate world, which was the trend, which most architects were doing, what we were decided to do is to work for the people that were being affected by the corporate corporatization, the privatization of everything. And so our organization, Coordination Strategies, was mostly an advocacy organization that 
found areas we first started in Europe. For example, our first uh, project in Europe was um, in an area where a lot of Muslim populations, specifically from Turkey and Morocco, were being displaced uh, by private corporations. And so we started um, uh, developing kind of uh, advocacy tools to um, uh, counter, to protest, to reject, to strategize what to do so they could stay, right? Um, and different projects uh, started to take different shapes. For example, the one that you are seeing right now in the screen is a project that we did in Milan um, with also a lot, of, a lot of refugees from Syria uh, a lot of Muslim refugees, which were being sidelined in this area in Milan, which is called Quartiere Canino, uh, that, um, and without any form of support from the state uh, in actual poverty. And we worked with a series of artists and also an economist and urbanist and so on to develop festivals of protest, but also tools, uh, pedagogical tools, um, libraries, um, dance uh, schemas and so on, to create an awareness so that um, the government could pay more attention to the decision. At that time, they were battling because they were closing a public school that this is where the kids were going, the, the, the kids uh, of the refugees. And so our work as cohabitation strategies was to bring alliances and to agitate population so that it would work in favor of certain directions that we wanted development to happen, right? And so uh, this is you know, one of the projects that you see there. Uh, I can uh, go on and on talking about many other projects. We develop around 16, 17 projects in different areas in the world, in different continents. Um, but another project before I go into that 11 points that I mentioned before, I wanna to touch into this other organization that my mentor, David Harvey and myself um, began in Ecuador, which is parallel to the work that we were doing with cohabitation strategies. Uh, David Harvey and myself got invited by the president of Ecuador um, to start a new research institute over there. Um, and uh, the purpose of that institute was to survey the uneven, the uneven development that the policies of Rafael Correa, one of the leftist presidents of, at that time, the leftist president of Ecuador, uh, what the policies were producing in the territory. And so we created a, an organization of around the four, we're 14 uh, researchers with a lot, of, a lot of links with indigenous population. And we started to work directly with the government at a ministerial level, but also at the direct presidential level. So we had um, very close contact with presidents, uh, with the president, and we've had very, very close contact with different ministers from the Minister of Culture, the Minister of Development, the Minister of Economy, Minister of Housing. And we started to develop strategies, but also at the same time, critiques of different policies in there. This project with David, we lasted three years until Rafael Correa started to lose a lot of support and then we had to close. But one thing that I've learned in these three years is that um, rather than working so much as an advocacy level, as I was doing in cohabitation strategies, this organization that we started in Ecuador, which is called CENEDET, in, in Spanish is Centro Nacional Estrategia para el Derecho al Territorio. That would be like a national strategic center for the right to the territory, something like that. This project um, taught me something very important, which was that we could do much more by being close to the top-down structures than we could ever do in cohabitation strategies by being close to the bottom-up structures by, with the communities. And this certainly presented us as a paradigm. It might seem uh, commonsensical. Yes, of course, the people that, that lead um, have uh, much more power to transform the environments. But what we wanted to do with cohabitation strategies was actually to empower the base. And in the many projects we did, we found that only 10% or if not less of what the strategies that we developed were implemented or were successful. And what we were finding is that all of these things that we wanted to do needed strong um, changes in the legislation, in the norms, in the sort of uh, the rules of the city, right? Um, so to give you an example, we're working in, uh, uh, at some point in Philadelphia 
And uh, we needed a land bank that recently Philadelphia was uh, being formed and, and because we were going to share some new properties uh, to different masses of population um, in South Philadelphia. And uh, it turned out that the majority of these uh, land bank, uh, the, the, the land that the city had uh, was already earmarked for New York developers, right? And so um, this was very frustrating for us. And we realized that no matter how much we worked, at the bottom, we still needed to actually advocate for these things at the very, very ultra top down level. And working in Ecuador, working at that level um, uh, was like our first instance on saying like, we have to change our practice. So this, uh, the Senedet, we closed it in 2017. And David, uh, Harvey and myself started to uh, idealize what could be the next project considering that the bottom up was no longer that effective or it was never truly that effective, right? And we wanted to be effective. And so uh, by 2018, we started to look into the possibility of structuring a different kind of organization. And in 2019, we finally formed Urban Front, which is um, the organization that right now I'm working more diligently in. Um, and Urban Front was structured as the opposite of cohabitation strategies. Uh, Urban Front uh, is an organization that uh, wanted to work totally top down and become or somehow plunder the consultancy schemes of uh, the large international consultancies like PricewaterhouseCoopers or McKinsey or Deloitte or um, uh, Boston Consulting, etc., and become, because strangely enough, they, it does not exist, uh, become the first um, international consultancy of the left. That was the dream. And that continues to be the dream. Now, let me emphasize that the reason that it does not exist is because the international consultancy model is a neoliberal model. It's a model that came out of neoliberalism. It was a model that it was needed in order to support the privatization of everything in the last 40 years. It was the model that emerged uh, to aid in tax evasion. It was a model that emerged to basically help the corporations, right? Make more money, the cap capitalism at large. So for the neoliberal capitalists, the consultancy became the largest support structure, right? In our dream is how can we produce a consultancy that first starts to work at the, uh, let's say at the governmental level, but with progressive governments, in order to change the policy from the top down that permits the bottom up to actually uh, create interesting things, right? And so the, the, the purpose that we see in Urban Front is, is that, right? It's, a, a, it's an organization that first and foremost has an anti-capitalist ethos, right? That does not subscribe to the corporate structures, but tries to support the development from the top down of um, people, of organizations that are in the, in, the, in the grassroots, but by working with left-leaning governments or progressive governments. So you say, which are those governments? Our first client was Barcelona. Barcelona is a, it's a city that has a current uh, alcaldesa, a mayor, that she is uh, quite progressive. And when we were uh, working or starting to work in Barcelona, we um, realized through some members of Urban Front, which are from Barcelona, of the first mandate of Ada Colau, actually, that even the, the progressive governments had no choice but to hire private consultancies like McKinsey and so on, because the governments have been so weak, so weakened, so um, deployed of their capacity to strategize because all the strategy always comes from the private sector, that they need to hire these organizations. And so we saw that gap, right? That how, is, how can we make the, uh, the progressive governments hire urban fronts rather than hiring uh, McKenzie or PricewaterhouseCoopers and begin to strategize how to give more power to people. So the first strategy was that anti-capitalist ethos. Um, the second one, had to do with working from a dialectical um, uh, and obviously transdisciplinary perspective. David Harvey here is pushing the buttons of an installation we did in Chicago. Uh, 
of the different people that we started to invite in the organization, to the organization. Now, in 2019, while we were forming Urban Front, we said we have to invite a very specific kind of people. And uh, first of all, they had to be friends or people that we had worked or known uh, for some time uh, on the long run, but also people that had um, a, a very strong experience working in governments. So for example, when we were working in, in Ecuador, we um, became a very close friend of ours, Ana Rodriguez, which was the Minister of Culture uh, at that time. That's the person that you're seeing right now. Um, and Ana um, had enormous experience working with governments at different levels. And this is the kind of person, and Ana comes also from a discipline of anthropology. The person that you see here in front, Mauro Castro and Laia Forné, they're both, uh, one is economist and the other one is anthropologist. Now, this is the chief urban planner of Barcelona, Josep Boigas. Uh, and so we started to grab from people from Latin America, uh, people from Europe that we have worked with, and people from North America that we have worked with, right? Um, with different possibilities, right? Uh, Galapin, the person that you see right now, or Gabriel, Gabriela, all of them have different disciplinary strains, lawyers, etc. And at the same time, uh, this, is, this will be one of the, the, the third principles that we see, is that we could embed uh, to a very specific political milieu, right? Uh, how to embed uh, all these transdisciplinary knowledge and always be close to the grassroots. You know? And the third part, I guess, in this case was, if we were gonna structure a consultancy that work with top level, we also needed to have an arm that worked with the bottom up to guide them how to use the changes that the top level was uh, producing. And, uh, and then a part of Urban Front is that, it's a foundation within Urban Front that supports uh, grassroots groups um, at, uh, and to show them how to take advantage of the different changes that are happening um, in, the, in the top-down structure. So it's kind of like a pedagogical, um, a pedagogical frame. Um, and uh, again, the, the organization, imagine, we started in, in 2019 and the pandemic came, so we're still quite uh, young. Right, uh, but we're doing, we're trying to do that. Now, uh, fourth principle uh, that I present here is um, a relationship which was the unalienated relationship to nature. Um, a, this is a very important thing today, specifically as uh, concepts of green economy are uh, becoming very popular. I teach a class that is on urban political ecology and uh, at the new school and the, um, students um, tend to think that what they're going to be learning, which is what happens actually in the majority of uh, environmental programs around the world, what they are going to be learning is um, how to do the technical part of what the economy wants. What I mean this is that when we're talking about urbanization, the first thing that comes into mind to a student is, um, are we going to do sustainable projects, meaning put trees here or like um, rainwater uh, stuff or uh, batteries, solar power or uh, lead certified buildings and all of these kinds of things that the, the markets have taught us on how to address the environmental questions. The things I do with my students here are precisely uh, uh, move them away from this line and try to conceive um, uh, that these types of strategies always are relying on the private and capitalist profit in order to succeed. The same with the Green New Deal and so on. And how to have an unalienated relationship to nature. First thing is that we have to conceive as Marx told us to conceive what is nature. Nature as something that is produced. So nature as something that we are producing. Remove that uh, sort of duality relationship in which we can produce um, a perfect sort of environmentally friendly building while at the same time continue to exploit um, populations, right? And this is the biggest question here. Uh, we can have the most sustainable cities, but that sustainable city most certainly like it happened in Saudi Arabia, what is what Naranda Modi tried to do in India, uh, it will be produced by slaves uh, or people that are very close to slavery right, in uh, large swaths of exploitation. And the people that are gonna take advantage of that environmental issue are actually the rich, right? 
uh, the poorest populations of the planet are never going to be living in these environmental uh, friendly spaces because the way that the economy is being set up is actually not for them to be there. You know, it's for the rich people to basically publicize that they are super environmental. So we have to think of an unalienated relationship to nature in which the production of nature also enters into the production of human nature and how human nature and the social conditions of it are embedded in the creation of a new kind of city. You know? um, a fifth point that I'm gonna be addressing here. is of course the questions of ingrained identities and the identity justice. Um, this is a much more complicated matter, specifically in the last, uh, well, it has been over the last decades, so obviously, but in the last years, um, through the pandemic, through the production of the Black Lives Matters, um, different also indigenous movements that have become even stronger at the moment in Latin America, etc. It's how to engage with the concept of um, identity without removing the capitalist um, sort of trace that uh, that helps it empower, right? How uh, to work in the conditions of co-optation co or against the co-optation of such sort of identities and begin to conceive the produced identity as a difference, you know, as a difference of different expressions of culture but that are embedded in some form of anti-capitalist ethos. You know? Not so much to focus the whole activism on the identity question. You know? So this is something that you know, we are, have been uh, discussing. I put this slide on purpose because Rob Robinson has very much part of the, uh, of the on, on Homeless uh, New York exhibition. Right? And Rob has taught me a lot and, uh, and Hutt, David too and has taught us a lot, which is, how to create pedagogies, how to equate people's knowledge. And this is me coming from academia. Um, a, a lot of the academic structures don't consider people's knowledge as proper knowledge. Um, I have faced in different universities that I have worked when I'm trying to hire, uh, let's say a faculty or someone that could help in a studio or in a class that does not have a graduate degree, that does not have a PhD, um, uh, universities have a hard uh, uh, problems, I mean, have, of actually accepting or paying them uh, because they're not, you know, they're not according to them, you know, properly educated to be hired by a, a higher institution, a higher education institution. One of the things that we have been trying to do a lot is that how do we incorporate the experience of people into the projects? Uh, into the consultancies that we do and trying to bring people that have been working perhaps for 30 years on the housing programs that might not have a, a graduate degree, that might not have, you know, their, uh, uh, the academic experience that um, formal academic education um, uh, desires and bring them into projects, right? Um, and bring them into the consultancy as such. And this has been and continues to be a very difficult uh, thing. So the idea of... Uh, pedagogy of the people, uh, people's knowledge. This is what Orlando Falsborda from Colombia uh, used to say, how to bring the people's knowledge uh, even with more value than the academic knowledge as such. And, and that uh, is um, part of the members of Urban Front are composed not only of like super like PhD experts, but on the country of also people that have a lot of experience within. Another big question that uh, comes for, to us is a question of, uh, uh, the repurposing of technologies. Um, you know, the majority of you that are listening to this might already know that Marx uh, was uh, a fanatic of technology. And, and Marx used to, in his own ways, used to say that uh, technology was the thing that would make possible communism. And when we see technology today, it's very complicated because it's precisely the opposite. Uh, we all have read the doomsday scenarios um, about the future uh, without employment because the robots or artificial intelligence is going to take over. And in the current uh, sort of capitalist structure, that for sure is something that we are facing, right? 
But if we look at technology from another perspective, uh, the technology that replaces human labor, especially arduous human labor, labor that does not want to be uh, made by a human because it's very exploitative, how can that actually replace a human being um, soft, suffering from this and, um, and liberate them and emancipate and how can it help emancipate? How can we use, to put it in short, technology uh, at the benefit of people? And this is what Marx saw in technology. Marx, uh, technology had always like these two phases. Technology in the power of the capitalist will produce more inequality and will produce you know, more human toil. Uh, technology at the hands of the social, of the collective, has enormous potentials. So one of the things that we've been trying to um, uh, consult with is how uh, cities can begin to uh, incorporate different kinds of technologies um, that, um, that are publicly owned and slowly uh, become more developed in trying to compete with the private, right? Because at this point, if we don't start doing this, it's going to be uh, almost impossible to compete anymore. So, for example, in Barcelona, one of our members, Galapin, started to develop um, uh, uh, some kind of software for the city of Barcelona that is called the CDIM, uh, which is owned by the city of Barcelona um, uh, for decision-making processes within the city, not relying so much on the technologies of Microsoft and Google and so forth. And how can we bring technologies back to the ownership of the public, basically? Right. Um, this is uh, what you're showing here. What I'm showing here is uh, a project that we did at Covitation Strategies. But you see, the next step for us would be how to return from the public to the collective. Uh, we always say that the first paradigm of the 20th century uh, was uh, a capitalist paradigm of the 20th century was the welfare state, in which a lot of people still try to rely a lot on. And I jokingly or reductively say that the welfare state by, was uh, a condition in which the, pop, the, the people were transferring the resources to the public. Right? But the public was represented by a state that took decisions for it. So this is why we tend to refer of uh, welfare states as majoritarily paternalistic states. No? Um, in the next paradigm was of course neoliberalism in which the resources were uh, given by the private, given to the private, right? So the transfer was from the public to the private. And then we see everything that is around it. We feel that the new paradigm, the paradigm of the 21st century should be no other than the transfer from the public to the collective. So contrary to the welfare where the public was being managed by one paternalistic entity, taking decisions for everyone, our intention is to emphasize collective power and collectives, not just one collective. And we've been uh, trying to consult governments on how can they begin slowly to transfer resources to collectives so that the collectives could manage them themselves rather than the city, right? And so we are working crazily strong, I mean, on this new paradigm, right? How to transfer, how can a city begin to transfer resources that belong to the city instead of transferring them, whatever is left from the, the neoliberal times, but whatever belongs to the city, instead of transferring continuous transfer to the private corporations, how can they transfer to collectives that are self-governed? And that's uh, one very big point that we want to do. So the redistributive uh, yeah, fiscal policies is one thing that um, we've also been advising a lot. Um, and that has to do with what I just said before, the transfer of resources for public management, for, for collective management, sorry. In this case, where we mean by um, emphasizing redistributive fiscal policy is, uh, for example, at the moment in New York City, those of you that are familiar, uh, I assume a part of the audience of this uh, will be from New York. Um, uh, since the de Blasio, well, actually Bloomberg and so on, uh, large developers have uh, a lot of tax abatements so for them to develop private luxury housing, right? Um, the common trend for us would be that those subsidies continues to exist, but rather than giving those subsidies to private developers, 
they would be again given to some kind of nonprofit, different structures of nonprofit developers or uh, grassroots organizations with the power of actually coordinating the development of new projects through these subsidies or fiscal subsidies and distribution. So we think that, that, that taxation has a very, very important um, role to play in how we transform it in the uh, coming uh, years. I mean, we saw during the pandemic that um, redistributive politics were applied, um, that there is money there, but that the money actually is going to the private corporations. And so what we want at the moment is how can we trace fiscal directives um, and consult on how to change those into benefiting more different kind of groups uh, in the ground. Um, the next uh, and almost last one is the formation of solidarity economies. Um, when what I refer to as solidarity economies or what everybody refers to solidarity economies, of course, is linked to the things that we said before. You know, we talked about environment, artificial intelligence, etc. But uh, the formation of solidarity economies is like the inner network structures that sustain different collectives, right? So I said about the transfer of power to collectives. I said about the fiscal redistribution to collective power to grassroots powers. But what to do with everything that gets transferred, right? So we have to think about new formations of solidarity economies that have large networks, inner city networks, but also inner regional networks of different products in different conditions. You know? uh, rather than thinking about, you know, uh, let's say, uh, New York made or like made artisanal made and so on, which is a very individualist way of thinking, is how can we construct uh, collective structures, uh, large networks of these organizations, um, the small economies that uh, can uh, be supported through the coordination of different other economies in different other cities or in different other regions around the world. One thing that we must not forget also is that Marx was, uh, was very, um, uh, supportive of the idea of some form of international, you know? not globalization, but an international. And the international had a lot to do with this. The idea that there was international cooperation and collaboration, we don't see any other future in this. I mean, we have to have steel production chains that are uh, cross-continental, but they have to be supported into some form of solidarity economies. So this is also part of what Urban Front is trying to do is to push um, from the top down, the formation of specific instruments that support uh, uh, solidarity economies around, uh, depending on where we're working. And lastly, um, which is, um, I think uh, what is might be most relevant for the on homelessness uh, projects is the development of lineaments, rules, regulations, policies, um, and uh, law, legal instruments that support non-speculative property. Because of course, we all believe that private property that is for the expense uh, that produces profit is uh, totally against um, uh, any form of uh, principles of equality. Um, we believe that housing is a human right um, uh, and housing should not be uh, speculated upon. And therefore, we have to show the world that it can be done with non-speculative property systems. Now, New York is very advanced in some cases there, well, not New York in general, but New York has very advanced examples of non-speculative property systems, such as um, the Cooper Square Community Land Trust. I mean, land trusts have become very, very popular recently, but I must say that as many people try to make one, it has become almost impossible to replicate the success of the Cooper Square Community Land Trust. And the Cooper Square Community Land Trust has almost 40 years, a little bit more than that, um, uh, of going on, and, and there's a reason why it cannot be reproduced. <clears throat> and the reason is because the Cooper Square Community Land Trust started at a moment where there was policy put in place that supported or that could support the creation of that. The policy has changed. There are many different instruments that have, were created to support the private enterprise, and therefore we feel that this needs to be updated, that there has to be other forms of instruments that push <clears throat> for non-speculative property system that permits long-term lifetime tenure um, security for the dwellers, right? And so we've been exploring a lot of these instruments. And what I'm showing right now in the screen is an instrument that Cohabitation Strategy developed in 2014. Uh, uh, it's called Cooperative uh, Housing Trust. But we have uh, many options. This is many of our members are from around the world. 
And we've been exploring uh, different other mechanisms. For example, we have one of our members is from Uruguay, who was the, the president of the FUCBAM, which is the, the largest cooperative housing structure um, in South America. And, and I think the most important in the world in terms of what they have achieved. And we've been working a lot with them to develop these models, right? And so ultimately, I know that I'm almost there uh, with the, my talk. What I mean by unitary and unitary urbanism in this case. So I have a definition of what unitary urbanism is. And, um, and I will show on the screen and just now. We tried to define this and we grew on, on the idea of unitary urbanism. And let me explain first um, uh, through, I guess uh, Marx discussing the idea of unity, but the one that developed it the most, so the organizations that developed it the most was in the 1950s. There was an avant-garde organization that was called um, the Situationist International. And the Situationist International uh, was based in mostly in France, but it had members from uh, different parts of Europe. And uh, the, the main uh, figure that comes out of one of the main figures was Guy Debord, um, famous for a book called The Production of the, the Society of the Spectacle. And in this book, uh, he uh, discusses unitary urbanism, uh, but not too much. And uh, he actually created that term, but never truly explained what it was. And since then, I've had an obsession of, of co-opting this term. And this, this was an idea of like, you saw all these 11 points that touch, you know, again, from artificial intelligence to environment, to identity, to economy, uh, housing, etc. How can we conceive of urbanization from all of these points, right? And when we are talking about one thing, never avoid talking about the others. And uh, we start to create a bunch of diagrams like the ones I show you. And then later in uh, 2019, uh, David Harvey, uh, in the book that he was making um, at that time, um, asked me to help him draw uh, a, a diagram of he was conceiving of the three circuits of capital. Um, the things that you see there in the red, uh, uh, first, uh, the production of commodities of value and surplus value valorization is uh, exactly what the first volume of capital um, talks about. The second one, a second volume is the other red square that you see there, which is the realization of value in money form. And the volume three of capital was all about distribution of money, right? And so David Harvey's uh, recent, I would say, like last decade's project has been to create a unitary edition of the three volumes because it was more common that the famous book was always volume one. And he always found value in looking like the best value, looking at all the volumes as one large project. Recently, he has been growing this conception because he's coming with a new book on the Grundrisse of Marx. So he's been looking at Marx from a, a picture of a totality, right? And what we've been trying to do is pretty much this diagram, which is very abstract, and I don't have time to explain it in there, but it's David Harvey's understanding and conception of what capitalism is, right? And how it works. Now, in 2021, which is what comes out next, in the installation that I'm, with the installation that I began uh, showing you, uh, I described this, unitary urbanism, is an anti-capitalist and transdisciplinary practice that attempts to bridge popular and scientific knowledge to co-produce social and environmental justice in cities. This is uh, my definition. This is the definition that we're working with um, in, uh, in Urban Front. And what we're trying to do with this, we're already Wikipedia and, um, and so on. We're really trying to push this idea of unitary urbanism as, a, as what you read there. Now, um, in the installation that I'm showing you there, one big diagram that we did was what I show you for David Harvey, but it's this diagram that is shown right now at the On Homeless New York. This diagram basically uh, discusses the three circuits of capital, and, but how more ingrained is the, the pictures that we normally have of what capitalism is in the city. Um, we first um, start with that, that kind of teal color that I'm showing right now where it says capital. So that's the first strata, that is the strata of capital. Everything starts there. Um, and how capital is distributed or works or here with taxation uh, towards the state. Um, and I'll show you more or less how it goes into there. 
the state obviously right now with the military industrial complex, that's where we put uh, a missile over there. Um, the state has its own state expenditures that help reduce urbanization and so on. The people that you see there, perhaps you can see it, perhaps not, but they all have names and they're the different kind of discipline that gets into it. For example, the lawyer, the statistician, the real estate agent, the financier, uh, the president, etc. And then from the other side of capital, we have the capitalist profit, the bourgeois demands, and the interest that also feeds the product of urbanization. Now, from this point on, we have how, so the part above is kind of this abstract when we hear in the news, the investors or the states or everything, things that are not materially reproduced. This middle layer, the red layer, is actually the layer of the city. And this is what we see, but this is what it gets produced. So from the, from the side of the state and from the side of the private enterprise, we have um, the welfare demands, in this case, hospitals or healthcare, which was still very apparent because we haven't stopped with the pandemic. Obviously the production of culture, uh, more privatized than ever, but still there's, there's a lot of, like there's more leaning towards that private space rather than the state. Infrastructure spending, sadly, also more becoming privatized rather than the state. Um, circulation of fictitious varying capital of interest, which, which is the uh, housing in general or buildings, you know, that's how Marx discuss it. The production of nature, our ideas of nature from state parks, national parks to parks like Central Park, um, all the way into the state expenditures such as roads and so on. And then, of course, the rent extraction, which get produced with these massive buildings that we see on. Again, uh, just to emphasize the little figurine that is in pink uh, be beneath one of those skyscrapers to my left is the architect, right? And so they, they each um, discipline kind of like alone has its own space, but it's very difficult to conceive how all of that is implied in the unitary comp uh, composition, right? Now, from this point on, we're talking about the things that produce that city, right? The things that, that plunder um, the environment, that plunder people. In this case, industrial profit and what Marx would call the free gifts of human nature, which are people, the people that are exploited, enslaved, and so on. And then the reproduction of labor power. Here we have pollution, we have industrial profit, we have distributions. Um, obviously, the evergreen crisis, right? I mean, how that gets distributed back into the city. And then we have the technological development from the other side, the destruction of nature, the creation of satellites um, and the creation of different means of production, food um, and extraction, extractivist industries such as oil and so forth, right? And then overall, this brings us a, a picture of what we talk about what unitary urbanism should be, right? And this is the, the, the total uh, sort of a, a picture of the spaces that we are trying to work simultaneously. And that's the most important part that I want to emphasize. This is a simultaneous um, sort of a project, right? Um, rather than being one of those figurines that you see there, which, you know, like the architect was there or the, the artist is there, our task is to try to look at the urbanization in general in this big picture. So this was my last slide. Um, this is uh, what used to be Competition Strategies, what is now Urban Front. And then I want to promote my podcast, which is called Cities After, which I have on democracy at work um, uh, with uh, Richard Wolf and there's other uh, podcasts that are coming there. And thank you very much. And this is all of us in the Urban Front, by the way, uh, where we are. Uh, and I forgot to mention this, but yeah, this is all of us. Um, Yes. Um, thanks again. Thank you so much, Miguel. <laughs> I'm so sorry about making a mistake on the uh, introduction that it needs to be combined with the, um, the public sector, and then it will become this uh, the group efforts. So yes. So. Uh, is it possible to get some questions from the audience? Yes, I, I, I have a, a few minutes left, yes. Thank you. Uh, anyone who would like to ask questions, please unmute yourself, I think. That might work.
Hi, Miguel. I Hi. um I joined 20 minutes late. I I'm, I'm sorry, but um I I wanted to ask you if you have any advice for me because it's it's just ironic that when um when I graduate, I'm applying to ESF and um which is SUNY ESF if if if, mm -hmm. if you don't know what that is. Um yeah. I'm, I'm interested in affordable housing with the idea of sustainability. Um, my target area is actually Syracuse, New York, that is experience, uh, experiencing a uh, revitalization. Um, and their, their land bank has been trying to, um, you know, unload homes and, 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 and encourage people to come and invest in the area. So my question for you is, for myself as an individual with the idea of going into a community and wanting to do those things, which a lot of people, for the reasons that you listed, feel that affordable housing and sustainability don't coincide with each other because it's about the, the bottom line. What would what advice would you give me um, going into an area like say Syracuse with that idea of creating affordability, affordable housing um, using sustainable resources? I, yeah, it's it's a very interesting question. I mean, like what you're trying to do, I think it's 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 more and more of a, a very important trend. And I think when I say very important, is that I think something we need. I mean, um, uh, I still don't hear NYCHA, for example, talking a lot about you know uh, sustainability, you know, in their own pictures. They, I think, they continue to be very busy on on infill programs and all kinds of privatization schemes. Right. Um, rather than really focusing that they have so much potential, we talk, let's say, in the New York City, look at the, the amount of extension that uh, land that NYCHA has. Right. The, 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 it's very sad to see that they, there's no still a, the, a very serious program of how to, with this incredible land extension, how to create social enterprises that can support a different understanding of sustainability. And uh, what I'm trying to say here is that if you really want to be uh, have a sustainability, you, you have to always think about social and environmental sustainability come together. They're never separate, right? So planting a tree is not, for me, um, neither for Mars nor for us, is environmental sustainability. Because we're talking about two kinds of nature that are embedded there, right? It's like human nature and then the, the nature nature, you know, that we normally talk about. And those two are together in our social milieu. And so how do you start conceiving sustainability in, a, in a, let's say, in, in, in affordable housing is basically figuring out programs that uh, would uh, push a collective organization towards creating a different conception of what sustainability means. And then meaning that it's not talking about just like lead certification or this, because I totally don't recommend that you guys do that. First of all, it's useless and it costs so, many, so much money and you don't need that. But it's how to take advantage of the land in which the housing is embedded in and, and, and think about what systems can you um, produce there that aid you know, uh, the, the environment. So yes, when we talk about rainwater sort of, uh, you know, the, 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 yes, the collection, rainwater collection and all of that, um, we, we tend to think, well, we put some technology, some system. I'm trying to suggest that all of these practices that seem very technical need to have a social base. Right. So my advice to you is that never uh, separate the social base from the environmental base. Right. Whatever new technology you are going to be pushing for making these places sustainable, it has to be linked with a kind of technology that will support the social. Right. And then we can start talking about sustainability. Now, I guess that's that would be my answer. OK, thank you. Yes, I hope I said that. Uh, Rob, would you like to? Yeah, so I just, I'll be very brief. I, I want to thank uh, both you, uh, Professor Yamayori and Miguel for his presentation. Uh, if any students on this, I encourage you to follow uh, Miguel's work and the work of David Harvey. They've both been very influential in who I am. I thank Miguel for his earlier comments about uh, knowledge and who has knowledge and 
how we share knowledge. Um, I've been born into circles that I wouldn't otherwise be in because I don't have a graduate degree because of people like Miguel and David Harvey. So I'm very appreciative. And then finally, I'll just say I know Miguel very well and he's under some incredible personal issue right now. And the fact that he's even here, I'm impressed by and just wanted to say thank you publicly. I really appreciate you being here, brother. My pleasure. Yeah, my pleasure. Anything for you guys and for the cause. I mean, because that's what's important. I think all of you are doing amazing work and, and I'm so uh, proud of, uh, of you asking me just to be part of the show, you know, whatever form I could. Thanks, Miguel. If there's no more questions, um, Jason, would you like to ask any question? I mean, I think, you know, I, I, I'm sure this would be very difficult Miguel, to try to explain in, in such a short amount of time. So I guess if there's any further readings you have on that choice that you, that conclusion you came to, uh, to go from bottom up to, to top, yeah. top down and kind of what maybe what that theoretical model looks like since i you know you kind of you rush through it a little bit obviously because you had a lot to do but i'd, I'd like to read more and, and learn more about that yeah i'm, I'm trying to uh, to actually write at uh, the moment uh, uh, on this right um but i can recommend you two things i mean there's uh, nothing that i've said i think is not part of and, and of course much more of the recent books of um of David Harvey, um, uh, and uh, I, I would, I would be, I would encourage you, not only you. I'm sure you have read it, but to read it again and read it again. I mean, read obviously Marx in, in volume one, volume two, volume three. The Grund, actually, the the Grundrisse is the one that talks more about unitary work, um, and uh, the um, it would be from David Harvey's uh, early book of like Limits to Capital, uh, which is kind of complicated, but it's very interesting to read as such all this causes all these theories of unitary very well um and i would read Henri Lefebvre uh which is um uh, the you know a, a french uh, philosopher um that uh, wrote a book called the production de l'espace the production of space um and that book is just insane i mean it's just absolutely beautiful and I've also been incredibly inspired by Silvia Federici's uh, understanding of, um, of feminism, uh, because I think her understanding gave me a new entry point into gender issues, gender politics as a unitary topic. I mean, she just doesn't discuss it from, you know, from what I think sometimes sounds very deterministic when you're discussing gender and so on. I think Silvia uh, is very expansive without not touching into the gender questions. Um, I also think that uh, Angela Davis has been incredibly influential in a lot of her writings and what basically not her writings on her attempts to restructure the pedagogical frames of the Black Panthers. Uh, it was incredibly unitary what she was trying to do. I mean, I think it's just unbelievable. I mean, and, her, and the, the problem with Angela is that sometimes you can face, you face a uh, texts that are a bit complicated and some that are not, you know, but I encourage you to look at the campaigns that she was creating and that she was pushing for the Black Panthers, because those are super unitary, right, uh, that was she was supporting. And then lastly, I would say, uh, try to listen to the podcast. Uh, I think um, that my podcast is, uh, I try to explain a lot of this in much more detail, right? I have a few podcasts that discuss the unitary concepts, transdisciplinarity, but also very, put it very practical, meaning like the last one, I touched the issue of, uh, of oligarchy and the dark side of urbanization, for example, that's what it's called. Sometimes I talk about the uh, mass tourism, for example, and then I discuss from a unitary perspective what mass tourism is, um, uh, uh, housing the same. I mean, I have so many topics that I there already have the 20 episodes that are online and I plan to continue doing more. So uh, those would be my advices. You know, those have been like my my big heroes from Angela to Sylvia Lefebvre and David Harvey. Yeah. Thank you very much. So is, if there is no further questions, I would like to close the meeting. Thank you very much, Miguel. And thank you. Thank you.